Good morning. This is Maha Yogi speaking live from deep in the heart of We're doing Gita talks here with Braja Sundari and Nadia Sundari and Anindita. And we have interpretation available in three languages. And you can select your language. We're reading from the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Sarvo Panishadu Gavo Dugda Gopalanandana Parto Vatsa Shadir Bhokta Dugdam Gitam Ritam Mahat. Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all Upanishads. It's just like a cow. And Lord Krishna was famous as a cowherd boy, is milking this cow. Arjun is just like a calf. And learned scholars and pure devotees are to drink the nectarine milk of Bhagavad Gita. Ekam Shastram Devaki Putra Gitam Eko Devo Devaki Putra Eva Eko Mantras Tasya Namani Jani Karma Pyaki Ekam Tasya Devasya Seva Let there be one Shastra. What was spoken? My Devaki Putra, the son of Devaki, his Gita. And let there be one God, the son of Devaki, Sri Krishna, Eko Mantras Tasya Namami Jani. And let there be one mantra for the whole world Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And let there be one work, uh, devotional service to Sri Krishna. So, last week, we were talking about the sixth and seventh verse of the 12th chapter of the Gita. 12th chapter of Gita is called uh, Bhakti Yoga. So, there are all these different yogas mentioned in the Gita, Karma Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, uh, Raja Vidya Yoga. But here, Krishna points to Bhakti Yoga as the best yoga, the Maha Yoga. And he says, Yatu Sarvani Karmani, Mai Sanyasya Matparaha, Ananya Naiva Yogena, Mam Dayanti Upasate, Te Shamaham Samudharata. Mrityu Sangsara Sagarat, Bhavami Narchirat Parta, Maya Veshita Chetasam. He says, those who worship me, giving up all their activities unto me and being devoted to me without deviation, engaged in devotional service and always meditating upon me, having fixed their minds upon me, O son of Prita, for them, I am the swift deliverer from the ocean of birth and death. So last week, we discussed here the meaning of sannyas and how, it, of course, that means giving something up. But in the context of bhakti yoga, this is not mere renunciation, but uh, dedication or devotional service. And Srila Prabhupada comments that the Supreme Lord herein promises that without delay, he will deliver a pure devotee thus engaged from the ocean of material existence. Mrityu samsara sagarat. Sagar means ocean. And mrityu, like mort, morte, muerta. Mrityu means death. So Krishna is delivering from the ocean of material existence. He says, those who are advanced in yoga practice can willfully transfer, transfer the soul to whatever planet they like by the yoga process. But as far as the devotee is concerned, it is stated here that the Lord himself takes him. The devotee does not need to wait to become very experienced in order to transfer himself to the spiritual sky. In Varaka Purana, it says, Nayami paramam shtanam archir adigatam vinam Garuda skandamarupya yatecham anivaritaha. The purport of this verse 
is that a devotee does not need to practice Ashtanga Yoga in order to transfer his soul to the spiritual planets. The responsibility is taken by the Supreme Lord himself. He clearly states here that he himself becomes the deliverer. In the Naraniya, this is uh, confirmed, Yavai Sadhana Sampati, Purusharta Chatushtaya. The purport is one should not engage in different processes of karma or cultivate knowledge by mental speculation. One who's devoted to Sri Krishna can obtain all the benefits derived from other yogic processes, speculation, ritual, sacrifice, charity, and so on. That is the specific benediction of devotional service. Simply by chanting the holy name of Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, a devotee of the Lord can approach the supreme destination easily and happily, but this destination cannot be approached by any other process of religion. So the Gita says, Sarva Dharman Prichadya Mam Ekam Sharanam Braja Aham Tam Sarva Pape Vyo Moksha Ishami Ma Sucha. One should give up all other processes of self realization and simply execute devotional service in Krishna consciousness. That will enable one to reach the highest perfection of life. So Krishna continues and in the next verse, we find Maeva Mana Adyatsya Mai Budhim Niveshaya Niva Shishyasi Maeva Ata Udvam Nasangashaya. Just fix your mind on me, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Engage all your intelligence in me. Thus, you will live in me always without a doubt. And um, let's have a look at. Srila Sridhar Maharaj's Bhagavad Gita, just for a moment, because I like the translation there. It puts it a little bit more differently. He says, those who offer all their actions to me take refuge in me, their hearts absorbed in thought of me in pure devotion, and who thus worship and adore me. I swiftly deliver such dedicated souls from the deathly ocean of material suffering. So, fix your mind in me always, and repose your intelligence in me, Shamasundar, and you will ultimately abide in me. Of this, there is no doubt. So, I like the idea that uh, Srila Sridhar Maharaj has Krishna telling Arjuna, think of me as Shamasundar. Now, the next section of the Gita offers some alternatives. And here, Krishna tells Arjuna, well, if you can't do this, do that. And if you can't do that, well, here's something else you could try. And if you really can't do that, here's something easier for you. Now, a good teacher always gives his student um, a chance. If you're teaching and the students find that the practice or the technique that you're offering is too difficult, then a good teacher knows how to adjust the instruction so that the student is given an, an, a bit easier exercise. So if the student says, well, this is impossible, I can't do that. All right, try this. <clears throat> so Krishna tells Arjuna, he says, well, if you can't fix your mind on me without deviation, then follow the regulative principles of bhakti yoga. In this way, develop a desire to attain me. So he's saying, well, if you... <sighs> If raga bhakti is impossible for you, okay, I understand. Then you try sadhana bhakti. 
And through sadhana bhakti, you will develop raga bhakti. So practice the regulative principles. Uh, rise early in the morning, take bath, enter the temple, offer prayers, chant Hare Krishna, collect flowers, offer that to the deity, take prasadam, uh, and so on. That's all these different rules and regulations one can follow. And try constantly to listen to Bhagavad Gita and, and Srimad Bhagavatam from pure devotees. And then he says about, you know, if you can't do that, abhyase, uh, pyasamarto, si matkarma, paramo bhava. If you can't do that, if you can't do sadhana bhakti, then try to work for me. Because by working for me, you will come to the perfect stage. So, for example, uh, we used to have someone in the temple who would uh, repair the car. And he wasn't a devotee, but he would come by once a week. He liked the prasadam. He liked the company. Sometimes he would chant Hare Krishna with us. I remember he, he had a big black beard. He used to call himself uh, Mudha Mark. He didn't want to call himself Bhakta Mark because he thought that was too hot. So he called himself Mudha, Mudha Mark. And Mudha Mark used to come by on Saturday and Sunday. And we had four or five different cars. And he would give us an oil change in one of the cars and tune up the spark plugs on another car like that. So Krishna says, if you can't do sadhana bhakti, then do some work for me. Prabhupada comments. There are many devotees engaged in the propagation of Krishna consciousness, and they require help. So even if one cannot directly practice the regulative principles, he can try to help such work. Every endeavor requires land, capital, organization, and labor just as in business. The same work can be done for the satisfaction of Krishna, and that is spiritual activity. Then he says, now Krishna's backing off. He said, complete surrender. Raga bhakti, then, well, okay. Sadhana bhakti, well, do some work for Krishna and the devotees. Then he says, he says, if you're unable to do that, if you're unable to work in this consciousness of me, then try to act giving up the results of your work. Sarva karma pala tyagam. Pala means fruit, and tyaga means giving up. So give up your karma. Try to be self-situated. Shreyo hi jnanam abhyasaj jnana jnanam vishishyate jnanat karma phala tyagas tyagaj chantir anantaram. And he says, if you can't renounce that, engage yourself in the cultivation of knowledge. So it's very difficult to give up the results of your karma. But he says, you can take another step back and think about who are you? What is God? What is this world? What is karma? Better than knowledge, he says, is meditation. And better than meditation is renunciation of the fruits of action. So he says, try to come up at least to the level of giving up all your attachments, because this way you can attain peace of mind. Advishta sarva bhutanam maitra karne vacha nirmamo nirahankara samadhuka sukhakshami. Then he says, one who is not envious, but a kind friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me. Such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. So here Krishna is shifting. He's shifting gears a little bit. He's changing uh, 
the discussion towards the qualities of devotees. But before moving on, I think it's important to think about what has just been said, because the Bhagavad Gita is very pithy. It's a very concentrated knowledge. And in that sense, it's more Shruti or Upanishad-like than uh, the Puranas or other places in the Mahabharata, especially where stories are being told. Uh, Krishna is giving a very concentrated knowledge here where he says, all right, if you can't do um, Raga Bhakti, then practice Sadhana Bhakti. He's giving a gradation, but he's going from something very high to something very easy and attainable to the student. And sometimes it's said, especially by Kavi Karnapur in the Garo, uh, the Goro Ganodesh Deepika. It's a special book which talks about the associates of Sri Chaitanya and who they were in previous lives. Uh, it is sometimes said that Arjuna in his next life is uh, Ramananda Roy, or Ramananda Roy in his past life had been Arjuna. And this is sort of based on the profile of Arjuna as someone who engages in a very special conversation with Bhagavan Sri Krishna and Ramananda Roy as someone who engages in a very special conversation with Sri Chaitanya. It doesn't mean that Ramananda Roy is Arjuna, but it means that he's fulfilling the function of an interlocutor with uh, God himself. So I thought it would be interesting if, if we took a look at the search for Sri Krishna and, uh, and see how we, we see the exact same thing spoken, but this time by Ramananda Roy. So Srila Sridhar says, the famous talks between Ramananda Roy and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took place on the banks of the Godavari River. The name Godavari is significant, for it indicates that place where the highest fulfillment of our spiritual senses was given. Your senses are not to be rejected. If you can give up the spirit of exploitation and renunciation, then your senses will have their fulfillment with Krishna. Those tendencies bar your approach to Krishna. So properly approach Krishna. To properly approach Krishna, you'll have to utilize your senses to the fullest extent. This is the teaching of Ramananda Roy. That was dealt with on the banks of the Godavari. There in his famous conversation with Ramananda Roy, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began the approach to pure devotional service in a general and comprehensive way. He asked Ramananda Roy, Prabhu Koke Parashloka Sadhyara Nirnoi, what is the ultimate goal of life? So here you have the, the roles are reversed. Instead of Arjuna asking Krishna, you have Krishna asking the representation of Arjuna, Ramananda Roy, what is the goal of life? He says, I not only want to hear your statement, but also evidence from the scriptures. So we expect uh, devotees to speak like this, not simply to give their own uh, ideas, but evidence from the scriptures. And in that sense, the really good teachers in our line are erudite. They know how to represent the scriptures. They don't just tell you, well, I feel this there was a bolt of lightning, there was a big light in the sky, and now you have to follow my instruction. Uh, the real big teachers in our line, they refer to some scriptural evidence. So the answer came from Ramananda Roy. Roya kokis svadharma charane vishnu bhakti hoy svadharma acharane. 
discharge your own duty without expecting anything in return. So here you can see this is where Krishna's instruction starts with Raga Bhakti and then goes to Sadhana Bhakti and then Karma Bhakti and then, well, meditation, giving up the fruits of your action. So Ramananda Roy is starting at the beginning here saying, do your duty. Don't expect anything in return. Svadharma means Varnashram Dharma, Vedic so social stratification. And then Sri Dharmarsh paraphrases, he says, look, you're posted in your present position by your previous karma. According to your present position, you have to do your duties on one condition. Do them without remuneration. So this is a tough nut to crack, how to work without getting any credit, without getting any money for your work. It's very, very difficult. If you go on with your duties in Varnashram Dharma without any mundane aim, you can achieve Vishnu Bhakti, devotion to God. This is confirmed in the Vishnu Purana. So Sri Dharmarsh is breaking down uh, Ramananda Roy's teachings, which cover like 150 pages in translation with Sanskrit and Bengali. But here in the search for Sri Krishna, he's giving a nutshell. Varnashrama charavata purushena parapuman vishnu aradyate panta nanya tato shakaranam. The only way to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, is to worship him by properly executing one's prescribed duties in the social system of Varna and Ashram. Uh, Sri Ramarash comments. Here, Ramananda Roy says that Vishnu Bhakti is the object and ultimate destination. This is the Vasudev conception. Everything is in him and he is everywhere. So Ramananda is explaining that from our local interests, we must come to embrace the general interest. And that must reach the level of Vishnu consciousness or Vishnu Bhakti. So now you would expect that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a Vishnu Bhakta, a Vaishnava, he would say, oh, this is very good. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you very much and good luck to you. And the conversation would end there. But what does Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu say? He says, this is superficial. Go deeper. And Sri Dhamma says, well, if, of course, it may be thought that actual theistic life begins from here, giving up the special local purpose, acting for a universal purpose. But Mahaprabhu said, this is superficial. Go deeper. I once met a man who read the uh, Search for Sri Krishna. He came to our temple to thank us. And I said, oh, well, who are you? What do you do? He said, I'm a climber. I live in a, a park. It's called Yosemite. And uh, I said, how do you live in the park? And he said, well, when people come to make films of the park, I climb up on the rocks to put their camera. But my, my thing, what I love, is climbing the rocks, because I go higher and higher. And I, then I can see, oh, look, there's another place up there. I want to climb higher to get to the, the summit. And I said, why did you like the book? He said, in your book, it says, go deeper, go deeper. He said, I like that. <laughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is always telling Ramananda, go deeper. So Ramananda said, hmm, Krishna karmapana sarva sadhya sarva. To offer the results of one activity to Krishna is the essence of all perfection. This is the general conception of Varnashram. Ram Ramananda says it will be better to have direct consciousness that Krishna is the authority. So you can think, well, okay, the Varnashram system, this is given by God, I'm going to work in the system. But Ramananda says, no, you need to understand clearly, that behind this system, there's, there's Vishnu. Perform all your physical, social, nas national, spiritual activities in Krishna consciousness. 
And this way you can approach the goal of life. Mahaprabhu says, this is superficial, go deeper. So then Ramananda Roy, he quotes the Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharman Parityaja Mame Kam Sharanam Vraja. Give up all your duties and just surrender to me. So even Varnashram is uh, superficial. We may think I have this, this is my duty. But a king may leave his kingdom and become a Brahmin. A Shudra might give up his labor and become a beggar and chant the name of Krishna. A Brahmin might give up the sacrifice that he's doing and become a, a mendicant. Ex exclusively devote yourself to the cause of the Lord. Now, this is something that really puzzled me when I first heard it. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he hears Sarva Dharman Paritya Ja, which we always used to preach as being the highest. And he says, this is also superficial. Go deeper. That's not enough just to give up your, your ordinary duty and follow Krishna. And Ramananda Roy said, well, okay. You should, if you practice bhakti, you should do so understanding what's what. You need knowledge. So Ramananda Roy explains jnana mishra bhakti. Brahma bhuta prasanatma. Nashochati nakangshati samasarvesh bhuteshu madbhaktim labate param. One who comes to the stage of identifying with spirit above matter has nothing to do with this world. He's atmaram, he's self content. So Ramananda recommends keep in mind the spiritual platform, attain the spiritual platform, and then you can practice a higher kind of service. Mahabhu, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, no, this is also superficial. Such a person is only on the verge of devotional service. He has no substantial touch of devotion. He's not entered the domain of bhakti. He's just waiting in, at the door. He's at a marginal position may attain bhakti, but he hasn't attained it yet. Uh, negative forces are finished, but still he's just at the door. Ramananda says, all right, well, gane prayasam urapasyanamanta eva. It's difficult to overcome knowledge. You become spiritual and you think, wow, I'm spiritual. I'm a real spiritual guy. But that's also superficial. Calculation and underlying suspicion is there. We think, I want to understand everything first, and then I shall act. So faith is a higher concept than knowledge, because knowledge wants to be sure. I can't do this until I know. But faith takes the leap. I'm going to throw myself into the infinite. I'm going to leap into the infinite without any care for the consequence. I, I, I don't know what the consequence will be, but I'm going to surrender. So he says, the calculating mentality must be given up if we want to enter into the domain of the Lord, where everything is superior to us. So normally we think, uh, I'm, I'm ready to risk myself as long as there's some gain. So no risk, no gain. I have to risk myself. But the prospect of surrender is different. It's all about risk with no gain in mind. And in, in a sense, this is divine slavery. Srila Sri Ramarish comments, he says, so we have to enter into that transcendental land where even the earth, water, air, whatever we will find is made of higher materials than we ourselves are made of. Remember that the Vedas themselves, who are higher than us, aspire to be leaves of grass or particles of dust in Vrindavan. So if you want to enter into this realm, even the air, water, earth, everything there is, it's made of a, a superior uh, material. They are all guru, and we are disciples. They are all masters, and we are servants. 
We have to enter the land where everything is our master. So what kind of mentality do you need to enter into a world where everything is your master? We have to submit. That will be our real qualification. What we will be ordered to do, we will have to do. We are not to exercise our brain so much there. So here, uh, we're coming to the point of uh, jnana shunya bhakti, where devotion and dedication is, is free from calculation, from the need to know. Our brain is unnecessary there. Only our hands are necessary. Menial labor is necessary there. Brain there is enough. We are to enter that land if we like. It is a land of slavery for us. So we are to hatefully dismiss our brains and taking only our hearts, we must approach and enter that land. So this is an incredible, powerful statement uh, about surrender. And surrender is not to be taken lightly. You, you cannot surrender to everyone and everything. You must be careful about how you surrender. But when you come to the point that, yes, I have this faith, I'm going to throw myself into the infinite, that's the kind of surrender that you need. Sri Ramarsh continues, he says, we should think I am as insignificant as a mosquito, just as Lord Brahma did when he went to Dwarka to visit Lord Krishna. And it is not only for the time being, not that one will accept a humble attitude, finish his work, and then come back. No, we will have to accept such an insignificant position eternally. Of course, we may expect to be educated about Krishna consciousness, how it is good, how it is great, how it is useful to us. We will be allowed pari prashna, honest inquiry. In the transcendental realm, everything is our friend. They will come to help us, to make us understand that devotional service is beautiful and that Krishna consciousness is the best form of life. Our aspiration and purity of purpose is to be valued, not our external position. The recruiters from the outside will consider our purity of purpose, not, much our, not so much our present position and capacity. So this is the real secret of yoga. Lots of people practice yoga because they want better bodies, they want to have uh, a nice sex life. Uh, they want to have a better position in this world. But the teaching of Ramananda Roy uh, takes you to the highest level of transcendental wisdom in yoga. And though apparently it seems that we're going to be slaves, the result is just the opposite. If you can accept such an attitude of surrender and slavery, then he can, who can never be conquered will be conquered. Friends will come and help you. The sadhus will come and make you understand that we should become slaves, that Krishna likes his slaves very much. He is the master of slaves, and sometimes he wants to become the slave of his slaves. Gopi bhartu parakamalayor das das anu das. This is the key to success. And we can achieve the highest gain through this attitude. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Ramananda Roy, yes, this is true. The unconquerable is conquered by surrender. We can capture him. I accept this as the beginning plane of divine love. By giving, we can get as much as we risk, as much as we risk ourselves, so much can we demand from that unconquerable infinite. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I accept this as the beginning of Shuddha Bhakti, pure devotional service, but go further. So you can, you can find the further teachings of Ramananda Roy in the search for Sri Krishna, but going back to the 12th chapter, because that's our topic for today. So Krishna says, fix your mind on me, repose your intelligence in me, Shama Sundar, and you will abide in me. But if you're unable, so 
Ramananda Roy is giving you this kind of a ascension from the simple point up to the most perfect. And Krishna here is taking it down. He says, well, if you can't do that, he says, uh, try to attain me by the repeated practice of remembering me. Per perform sadhana bhakti. You can't do raga bhakti, do sadhana bhakti. If you can't do that, concentrate on offering your actions to me. Then, okay, karma mishra bhakti. If you can't do that, then give up the fruits of your actions, karma fala tyak. Then he says, you know, knowledge of me is superior to mere practice, meditation on me, superior to knowledge. So there's, you know, jnana shunya, jnana mishra bhakti. So if you can't do raga bhakti, do sadhana bhakti. You can't do sadhana bhakti, well, karma mishra bhakti, jnana mishra bhakti, sacrifice. You can't do that, follow Varnashram Dharma. Try to give up the fruits of your action. So there in the 12th chapter then, Krishna's giving you a hint as to what bhakti is all about. Of course, these teachings are esoteric. You can't really understand them just by reading the Bhagavad Gita. You must come in contact with a real teacher, a devotee, a Vaishnava, who can bring you into uh, the society of bhaktas, of sadhus and Vaishnavas, and show you, well, how do you, <clears throat> how do you meditate on Krishna? How do you perform sadhana bhakti? And <clears throat> an expert, depending on your guru, you know, an expert guru will be able to consider your capacity as a student and your abilities and fine tune uh, what will be helpful for you. That is, if the guru is interested in you, if the guru takes an interest and thinks, well, how can I help this person? Otherwise, we can just give people a formula and say, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. But if the guru takes a personal interest in you, and, and if you demonstrate to your guru your personal capacity, then he may say, well, all right, uh, this particular service will be good for you. Try and do this. Or this particular form of practice will be good for you. Otherwise, there's general instructions for everyone. But we can't come in contact with those instructions unless we develop a relationship with the sadhus and the devotees. We'll be like bees uh, licking the outside of a jar of honey, thinking, well, I can see there's the honey. But what's this? There's something between me and the honey. So the Bhagavad Gita is honey, but to really get to its inner truth, you need the company of, of devotees. So I thank uh, Braja Sundari and all of you for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, think about these things together. I'm not... A, a perfect human being in any sense. I'm not a perfect devotee, certainly. Uh, but I, I have known, I have met and known uh, high personalities like Srila Prabhupada, Srila Sridhar Maharaj, Srila Govinda Maharaj. And if I've gotten any mercy from them at all, uh, I have some ability to think about the teachings of Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of Srila Sridharmaj. And you all are helping extract something from me. That's my service. So I thank Braja Sundari and Brindavan Chandra and Anindita. 
and Nadia Sundari and Tapanandini and uh, anybody who's listening to this after the fact on Facebook, YouTube, okay. what's... Vrindavan uh, Chandra Prabhu is writing that many, many preachers are confusing Gunya and Jnana Shunya Bhakti, in which the devotee is something like removed from the search of knowledges. And Raga uh, Nunga in which uh, the devotee is removing from Aishwarya uh, the aspect of the glory of the Lord. Can you please, um, can you please uh, like tell us something about this topic and uh, explain us the criteria and the definition of these uh, stages of the spiritual path of Bhakti? Did you understand me? <laughs> and we don't hear you. We don't hear you. Uh, please unmute. Oh, no, I don't. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay, okay. I will, I will, uh, just a second. I will turn on the translation one more time. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. So, Please start, I'm translating. The question is about uh, Jnana Shunya Bhakti. So this is a bit confusing because we're saying the higher level of devotion should be without calculation and should not be contaminated by knowledge. And I remember hearing this story. I don't know if it's Puranic, but there was a pundit and a, a fool. And the fool goes to the pundit and he says, I want to be like you. And the pundit tells him, well, what do you mean? And he says, well, you're, you're very wise, aren't you? How can I be like you? And the pundit says, well, when everything that you've read and everything that you have not read is the same, then you can be like me. So the fool goes out and he forgets everything that he's read. Maybe he's only read one book, but he goes out and dedicates himself to forgetting whatever information was in that book. Then he comes back and tells the pundit, now I'm like you, because everything th that I have read and everything that I have not read, it's the same. The problem is, the fool is in complete ignorance. So in a way, uh, the Complete ignorance is similar to the position of Jnana Shunya Bhakti, and it's easy to become confused thinking, well, uh, Gorkishor Das Babaji Maharaj did not have a library. He did not have a collection of Bhagavatams. So someone who says we must not read, uh, chastity is better than erudition, uh, we need complete and perfect obedience. Uh, seems to make sense in light of Gorkishor Das Babaji Maharaj. Someone, but we need to be careful because uh, complete ignorance and deep wisdom may both of them be in silence. And we see, well, okay, the complete fool is silent, and the wise man is also silent. So there's the similarity. But the similarity will end when they speak. So the cowherd boys, for example, or the gopis, they don't read books. Uh, shall we imitate them? Is that Ganeshunya Bhakti? We need to be careful. Uh, a lot of people argue against 
erudition, uh, saying that, well, this is a form of contamination. But uh, Srila Sridharmarsh was erudite, and he was my guru, even more than Srila Prabhupada. I came to the feet of Srila Prabhupada in 1976. I was initiated by him and saw him lecture. But my great connection is with Srila Sridharmarsh, and he was erudite. Later, Govinda Maharaj told us after we'd published many books, hmm, books are not so important, now we need service. Uh, but Govinda Maharaj himself was, was very erudite. One should not underestimate his erudition. He was a great poet in Sanskrit. Later in his life, I remember he was constructing the Samadhi Mandir in uh, Navadweep for Srila Sridhar and he came to me and he said, oh, Mahayogi, can you write this down in Sanskrit, you know, leapy? I'm like, what, me? He's like, uh, yeah, you know, my memory is not so great. He was a Bengali speaker, you know, and Bengali speakers will read Sanskrit in Bengali leapy not Devanagari. He said, yeah, you know the Devanagari. Can you write this down? We're going to inscribe this on the wall. We're going to carve this into stone. Can you please write that down for me? I'm like, yeah, okay, I can do that. Uh, so there may be those who believe that, oh, well, you know, Govinda Maharshi wasn't into erudition, but that's not true. Uh, for example, there were many books of Srila Rupa Goswami, for example, that Srila Sridhar did not like us to study, like the Ujwala Nilamani, books of that nature. But he ordered Govinda Maharaj to print some of these books because he said, well, if they're not in print, we're doing a disservice to the Acharya. So we have to keep these books in print, but you're not really to read them. But Govinda Maharaj told us, you can find it in his tapes, that he took the opportunity to memorize uh, much of the Sanskrit of Rupa Goswami and others. So he was erudite. Uh, and there's no prohibition against being erudite or learned. The problem is, as Srila Sridhar Maharaj uh, draws our attention, right? The problem is calculation. The idea that, well, I'll, I will do this if I get that. And um, I will only do this if I'm sure. And the need for certainty is what vitiates uh, our faith. So I can only believe if I have a sign from God. Arjun in the Bhagavad Gita, of course, he, he seems to have a sort of weak faith because he wants a sign from God, and then Krishna shows him the universal form. But after Krishna shows him the universal form, he says, take it away. It's too much. I don't want to see that. Bring it back. I want you in your two-handed form, please. I don't want the Aishwarya and all that. But the problem of how to balance Ganeshunya Bhakti with Gyan, it's difficult, you know, how much, but it's, it's something like uh, the dilemma of the sleeping man. Uh, it's, it's easy to wake someone when they're sleeping, but if someone is pretending to be asleep, you can't wake them up. So, Say you know enough that you realize this is my course of action. I must do this. But you wait and you wait and you become like Hamlet. Uh, you know, I can't make a decision. I can't go this way. I need more information. I'm not sure. That's where Jnana Shunya Bhakti and Jnana Mishra Bhakti sort of come at loggerheads. You know. My guru told me, I believe in my guru. I have to do this. This is my course of action. 
but I have some reasons why I'm not going to uh, surrender completely. That, I think, is where the problem comes between uh, giving up what we know and just acting, making a decision, moving it. I don't need to collect any more books. This is where I need to go. Someone asked me once, uh, when I was in San Jose, they said, shall, shall we buy a house or shall we go to India? I should go to India. And they didn't vacillate. They took the money they'd saved and went to India. 30 years later, they thanked me. They said, thank you. That was it. It took us another 10 years to get the money to buy a house, but it was the best decision we ever made. Uh, at one point, I was in Los Angeles, California, uh, at the temple of ISKCON, and I had some money saved. And I could have left the mission and tried to create a life for myself. Uh, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a profession. I didn't have social security or anything. But I took what little money I had saved, and I went to India and surrendered at the feet of Srila Sri Ramar. And uh, I said, please accept me as your disciple. And Govinda Maharaj said, eh, you know, wait and see, wait and see. And they kept me on the edge of the razor blade for months because it was a prob problematic situation uh, accepting disciples from the West. Uh, wait and see. But in my heart, I knew I have to surrender here. I'm not going to play around anymore. So it's some, I think it's something like that. Jnana Shunya Bhakti means uh, you know what you need to know, but now it's time to surrender. Something like that. I don't know. I don't know if that helps Vrindavan Chandra of Odessa, but I thank you for being here with us and helping us with the Sangha and, and, and for asking a question. It's a very good question. That's one of those things that if you're serious, right, you think about for years. Is this Ganeshunya Bhakti or am I doing this out of my own personal self-interest? That's that's something for self-reflection and uh, self-analysis, I think. But the, the idea is that at some point you leave the self-analysis and you go, okay, that's enough analysis. I have to, do, you know, they're asking me to uh, pick up a, a gun and go out and fight. So do I sit here and analyze or do I go out and, and defend my country? You know, at some point you, you must make a decision. So in, in Bhagavad Gita, of course, uh, Krishna is telling Arjuna, make your decision. I'm not going to force you. Uh, obedience is not obligatory. But make, you know, knowing what you now know, do you sit and ask more questions? You know, Madhusudana Maharaj tells you, go into the garden and water the plants. And you think, no, you know, I have to listen to Maha Yogi's Bhagavad Gita talk to properly situate my consciousness before I do that, you know. <laughs> or do you just water the plants? So Gorky Shordas Babaji Maharaj, he's, he's there. He's in the zone. Haridas Thakur, he's chanting Hare Krishna. He doesn't need any more information. The cowherd boys are playing with Krishna. They're not going to think about it anymore. But the difficulty lies in someone coming along and telling you, don't think, don't read books, don't be erudite, be obedient. And that's a very tricky situation. Uh, when I was a boy, my father used to send me out to buy cigarettes. So he'd say, okay, go to the place on the corner and bring me my cigarettes. I said, I'm only eight years old. Uh, here, take a note. 
Okay. I go there and I said, I need some cigarettes. Here's the note. I come back and he says, uh, what, what is this? Your cigarettes. These are not Marlboros. Well, yeah, but that's what they had. So I thought you wanted cigarettes. And my father said, you thought? Who told you to think? Don't think. Okay. So two weeks later, the same situation came up. He sent me out to buy cigarettes. I went down there. They don't have Marlboros, they have camels. So I come back with no cigarettes. My father said, what happened? Where's my cigarettes? He said, I said, well, I went down. I asked for the Marlboros. The man said, we only have camels. My father said, don't you know how to think? You should learn how to think. Think! So all my life, I've been stuck between think and don't think. And that's kind of jnana shunya bhakti versus, you know, jnana mishra bhakti. Think or don't think for Prabhupada. You know, don't think for Sri Dharma. You know? <laughs> think for Krishna. Don't think for Mahaprabhu. So torn between these two difficult places, I find myself reading a tremendous amount. I don't know if that's really good, but I thank you for your, your question. Anybody else? Okay. Can, can we take? Uh, are you are you hearing? Yes, I can hear you fine. Tapanandini. No, no, no. Merida, Yucatan. You you know I I always say that let's see let's see what happens to take decisions and it means for me it means that. I can't hear you. Is that me? Well, as Govinda Maharaj used to say, wait and see. Um, I see. Uh, uh, I think we can hear Tapanandini when you remove the interpretation. Okay, I'll remove the interpretation. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, then uh, for me, it is that I have to see where the the light uh, goes, and because I want to be on the 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 light of, of consciousness, and I don't want to uh, to move according to my own desire. What do you think about this, Mahayogi? Well, that's why it's useful to take guidance from someone because you're right, we want to surrender, we don't want to move according to our own desire. But sometimes we don't know who we can take guidance from or we're left alone and we have to guide other people. So how do we know if we're being selfish or not? Then we can consult Guru, Sadhu, uh, Shastra, and the Chaita Guru. Chaita Guru is something like the sum total of uh, my refined consciousness after I've been trained and trained and I've thought about these things and I've been told and I've been told and I learned and I read. I have some internal criterion that can guide me. And when that coincides with the scripture and what the, the Vaishnavas and Guru says, then I can follow that. So you develop a kind of inner guide, inner instinct. 
And that's also Gana Shunya Bhakti. It's like when I paint, I paint sometimes. Uh, my mother was a painter. And when she died, I got her paints. So sometimes when I'm when I'm painting a sky, I can hear my mother's voice saying, why do you use so much blue? I told you, don't use so much blue. What's wrong with gray? Can you use, can you put a little red in there? I can hear her voice telling me things. It's similar in many aspects of our life. You don't have to be personally present with the guru in front of you, uh, personally guiding you all the time. You can remember what well, he told me, uh, die to live. He told me every wave is favorable. What would Govinda Maharaj do in this? What would Prabhupada do in this situation? He wouldn't be in this situation. What would Sridhar Maharaj do? He would never be in this airport at this. It wouldn't happen. What would Govinda Maharaj do? Oh, okay. Yeah, he might be in this airport. Maybe he would do this. You know, but we have enough guidance from, at my age, I'm 68 years old. I have a lot of guidance from my guru, from the Vaishnavas. I kind of know when I'm doing something wrong, but you have to consult your inner voice then, you know? And you can look for a sign. People like astrology for that. They look for a sign. What do the stars say? What does the moon say, right? Then the 11th canto in the teachings of uh, Uddhava Gita, I believe, there's an avidut who has 24 gurus. One guru is a prostitute, another one is a pigeon. Uh, north, south, east, and west are his gurus. Like that, you can learn something from many different gurus. You can be in a position where somebody tells you, why are you doing that? You should be humble. And then you think, ah, Trinata Pisu Nietzsche, he's right. <laughs> Of, uh, of real humility. Yeah, humility is very difficult. But again, you, you can fine tune humility. You, you don't have to be humble when people try to push you around and force you to do things that are not Krishna conscious. You don't really have to be humble for all the time for everything, but it's a general, we'll see next week. Oh, I wanted to say, yeah. So the next part of the 12th chant, uh, chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about the qualities of devotees. So you can check, do I have these qualities? Do other people see those qualities in me? And one of those is humility. So how to be humble. It's very difficult sometimes. Say you, you need to get on an airplane. And if you miss your plane, you can't bring, ten, you're supposed to bring $10,000 to Sridhar Maharaj. No, or Govinda Maharaj. Say you miss your, if you miss your plane, your plan is in jeopardy. That doesn't work. There are people in front of you who are pushing you back and saying, no, 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 go back there. You're going to miss your plane. Do you push forward? You know, when is it all right to push other people? You know, so all these questions, then, then you think, okay, well, but that's Gana Mishra Bhakti. I'm calculating. Gana Shunya Bhakti, I just push everybody aside and I get on the airplane. <laughs> I was at the airport in uh, Istanbul in Turkey and we had to catch a connecting flight we had about 15 minutes and they just had had a, a terrorist bomb attack in that airport about a week before so the security was really intense and I, I had to run on these people movers 
And people were like, why are you in a hurry? So I have to think, oh my God, am I being hum humble here? But the idea of Ganeshunya Bhakti, you, you could put it this way, don't overthink too much. You know, Madhusudan Maharaj tells you, go water the plants, do it. It's like in the old days when Prabhupada, uh, they would record him. And then instead of listening to his talk, they would fight over the microphone, the tape recorder, the headphones. And then when they came back to the temple, they found there were no batteries. So they lost the they lost the lecture, and then Prabhupada got on an airplane and went away, and they lost it forever. So because they're fighting over the microphone and the tape recorder and all these details, they didn't pay any attention to his talk. So Gana, Gana Shunya Bhakti, Gana Mishra Bhakti, these are very difficult questions. And uh, I thank Vrindavan Chandra for raising that. Not, you know, I'm not perfect in this respect. One one thing that struck me once, I was sitting with Sri Dharmaj at his feet, and we were asking him questions like that. And Sri Dharmaj leaned over and he looked at me and he said, You know. You know, he didn't give me like a long 20 minute answer. He was just like, You know do it. And another time he said, follow your star. Follow your star. And I thought that was really good. Later I found out in Dante, in the La Commedia Divina of Dante, Virgil tells Dante, follow your star. So, instead of analyzing the heavens, follow your star. That's all I have. I, I, hope, I hope it's been helpful. So, pray for my soul. Let's pray for the devotees in Odessa that they get divine salvation, they get illumination from... Krishna, from Govinda Maharaj, from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, let's hope that some divine mercy falls on Tapanandini there and Merida Yukatan. Let's hope that on Anandita gets some mercy that Nadia Sundari is blessed with whatever mercy shakti, bhakti, you need to continue doing the great service you're doing there in Villa Govinda. And let's hope that Krishna's blessings shine on Braja Sundari, who's organized this talk. I thank all of you once again. I'm very sorry, but I have to, I have to go. So... Jai Mahagi Prabhu Ki Jai. Jai Mahagi. Thank you. Jai. Jai. Praise to all of you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Dandavas. Dandavas. Всем мои поклоны. Please accept my obeisances. So see you next week. Увидимся на следующей неделе. Я думаю, что мы начнем читать тринадцатую главу. Это уже следующая третья часть Прабхупада Гиты. И до встречи. Снимите мой поклон.